Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's 6 o'clock. At this time, I will call to order the regular board meeting, October 5th, 2021. I will have a call for a period of silence and follow that by the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'll please keep in your thoughts and prayers the family of Elizabeth Hancock. She's a, an employee of TCS and her mother passed away recently, so please keep her, she and her family in your thoughts and prayers. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, good evening. You may be seated. Good evening, board. At this time, board, is there a motion to adopt the regular board meeting agenda? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? This agenda will be approved. Item number four, board has a motion to approve the minutes of the September 21st, 2021 regular board meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Those will be approved. <clears throat> Item number five, recognize national merit semifinalists. Ms. Bruinton, good evening. Good evening, board members. Tonight, we bring before you five Northridge High School students who've been named National Merit Semifinalists. As you know, this process happens every year. Um, they take about six, they identify about 16,000 students nationwide um, to be a part of the competition. In this first phase, we are named as a semifinalist. And around about March, we find out if students move on to the finalist stage, which gives them opportunity to access thousands of dollars worth of scholarships. Northridge High School had finalists, uh, semifinalists, finalists last year as well. I believe they had three. Tonight they had five to the list. Um, Dr. Tiger Evans is here tonight to present his students. Good evening. Good evening, Board of Education. Hope you're well. Good, good uh, evening, Dr. Daria. Uh, I do have the pleasure of recognizing uh, five Northridge High School students. But before I begin, I want to give you a little bit of information about the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. Uh, it started in 1955, and in the mission statement, there's two things. There's really two things that I think are important, and I want to stress them here. And these are their words. Uh, one of their mission statements is to shine a spotlight. Listen at this word on brilliant students. Brilliant students. That's a that's huge. That, that's a pretty big superlative there. And the second mission mission statement is to stimulate increased support from individuals and corporations to sponsor scholarships for outstanding scholastic talent. So we are blessed at Northridge this year in Tuscaloosa City Schools of having five students that were national merit semifinalists. And it's my pleasure to introduce those students to you tonight. Some of our students are not here. I know of two that are going to be out, but I'm going to mention their names and mention a little bit about them, if you, if you don't mind. And we're going to start. Uh, I did see our first student is Gabe uh, Fung. He, I saw his dad outside. He told me he was coming. So I'm going to kind of put him at the end, just hopefully that, that Gabe will come in. So I will go to number two. Our second National Merit semifinalist is, is Grace Jung. She, is, she emailed me about 30 minutes ago. Dr. Evans, I'm sorry. I am not able to attend, but Grace is one of our semifinalists. We move to number three, Mr. Britton Purdue. Welcome, Britton. And believe it or not, hey. <laughs> Britton is a drum major in the Northridge High School Band. And what's interesting about that is so is Grace, who could not be with us tonight. And if you ask John Kane, who is our band director at Northridge High School, he will tell you that he made these two National Merit semifinalists. And this is, this is what I mean by that. If you look statistically at the data of National Merit Scholarship folks, guess what they're in? Fine arts. They're in fine arts, whether it's chorus, whether it's drama, whether it's band, it's so important, so important. I always look at high schools as a pyramid, 
And at the top of that pyramid, of course, is academics, teaching and learning. But this corner, fine arts, and this corner, athletics. And in the middle, I love clubs, because I think it's an interesting part of a high school relative to relationships. So Brent not only is a drum major in our band, he also, and I'm, these are my words, so if I embarrass you, I, I apologize. <laughs> he is a brilliant mathematician. And if I'm wrong what I'm about to say, please correct me. Right now, he has, this is my word, conquered all his math classes through the University of Alabama relative to the major you're going to major. Is that accurate? <laughs> and, and that's not like Dr. Evans when he mastered college algebra. That was it. I'm talking all the way to Calculus 3, so congratulations on that, sir. Britton, Purdue, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Vivian Sue is another of our National Merit semifinalists. She has an illness in her family and thus is tending to them and helping, so I wish her the best on that. And I turn around behind me and give you the name of Mr. John Warden. John, if you'll please stand. And, and John, you have the best opportunity here because you're the only one. Can you please introduce your parents and who came with you tonight? Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Something about John. Um, as I mentioned the pyramid and mentioned the fine arts, of Brittany Lee. Oh. I mentioned the fine arts. John is, these are my words, but I think I'm close, proud to represent Northridge High School in the field of soccer. So we mentioned athletics. John is a fabulous soccer player. He's been doing it for a long, long time. And what's so great about that is once again, if you look at statistics and National Merit Semifinalists, those students in all of high school, those students that are involved, not just coming to school for academics, whether it's fine arts, whether it's extracurriculars, where it's clubs, guess what? Those students who are the busiest are your best academic students at a high school. So John plays on the soccer field. Also, he is very excited and very proud to have, these are my words, master a second language in Spanish because he enjoys his Spanish classes, not only at Northridge, but also at the University of Alabama. Congratulations. John Word. I do not see Gabe. We could introduce his dad if he came in, but he's not here. But I do want to thank everybody. Thank you, Dr. Darian. Thank you, the Board of Education, for allowing me to introduce these great kids. Congratulations. Dr. Evans, when will the National Merit semifinalists become finalists? Uh, around February and March, we'll find out. And then if we're lucky, one of those, one of our finalists, hopefully our father will be, will actually earn scholarships from the National Merit Corporation. Well, it goes without saying. Uh, do you mind introducing your folks, please? Uh, yes, this is my dad and this is my mom. Welcome, Mom and Dad. <laughs> Thank you. Let me tell you something about Gabe. Real quick, I, I'm going to embarrass you for a second, okay, sir? I know you love that. I asked our students, tell me a couple things about yourself so I can tell the board. Well, this is typical Gabe. He almost gave me a resume that was about 16 pages. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but it was phenomenal. And here is some of that right now. Gabe, heavily involved in robotics, physics, and piano, a state winner in piano, if I'm not mistaken. Now, I'm going to say something about his physics, uh, his physics talent, and it's going to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but those who know me know I do not. So here it is. Gabe uses, and please correct me if I'm wrong, sir, quantum espresso program to conduct his physics, physics research at the University of Alabama on crystal lattice formations. Did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's impressive to me. That's very, very impressive. Also, one more thing about Gabe. He is, he is such a leader 
Uh, he is one of our office aides, and I guarantee you, Dr. Uh, Derry, if you come into Northridge High School, you may see Gabe there all by himself, running the office, being the principal, because that's about where he is now. So ladies and gentlemen, Gabe Fung and family. Thank you, Dr. Evans, and obviously on behalf of the entire Board of Education, I would like to extend our congratulations for uh, your excellence in academics and your rep fine representation of our system. Uh, we expect to see all of you here back in February when the National Merit finalists are announced. Uh, we're super, super proud of, of what you've done for yourself and your families and the system, so please accept our congratulations, and thank you for being here this evening. You're more than welcome to stay, but you may exit stage right if you would like to. <laughs> okay, board. Uh, item number six is recognize October as Dyslexia Awareness Month resolution. Dr. Pope. Good evening, sir. Good evening, board. <laughs> Tuscaloosa City Schools Board Resolution. Whereas dyslexia is a learning difficulty that is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. Whereas our district and community will benefit from an increased awareness of this, the early warning signs and the value of multisensory interventions for students with dyslexia. Now, therefore, the Tuscaloosa City Schools Board of Education do hereby proclaim October 2021 as the Dyslexia Awareness Month in Tuscaloosa City Schools and encourage all teachers, parents, and community stakeholders to learn more about dyslexia and to offer support to parents, educators, and individuals affected by this. Eric Wilson, Board Chair, Karen Thompson Jackson, District 1, Kendra Williams, District 2, Leslie Powell, District 3, Patrick Hamner, District 4, Erica Grant, District 5, Marvin Lucas, District 6, and Vice Chair, Erskine, Erskine Simmons, District 7. Thank you, Dr. Pope. We have each signed off on that, so be it resolved. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, item number seven, receive parent and family engagement resolution. <clears throat> we have a couple of seats on the front down here. It's going to be outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Pope. No problem. Ready? Okay. Resolution, Statewide Parent Visitation Month 2021. Whereas the month of October has been declared Alabama Statewide Parent Visitation Month by the Alabama State Department of Education. Whereas the visitation day and the entire month will emphasize the value of parents, guardians, grandparents, community members, and others, while showing support for Tuscaloosa City Schools administrators, teachers, students, and learning. It is therefore resolved that the Tuscaloosa City Board of Education joins the Alabama State Department of Education and other organizations in proclaiming Parent Visitation Month as an opportunity to promote and strengthen the ways in which teachers, parents, families, and students communicate and work together. Dated this fifth day of October, 2021, Eric Wilson, Board Chair, Karen Thompson Jackson, Board Member District 1, Kendra Williams, Board Member District 2, Leslie Powell, Board Member District 3, Patrick Hamner, Board Member District 4, Erica Grant, Board Member District 5, Marvin Lucas, Board Member District 6, Erskine Simmons, Board Member District 7. Thank you, Dr. Pope. We've each signed this, so be it resolved um, as we have signed. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, item number eight, public comments on non-agenda items. Ladies and gentlemen, I will call your name if you will approach the podium and uh, please state your name uh, loudly. I will hopefully not uh, mispronounce any names. If I do, I apologize in advance. You will have five minutes 
Uh, because of the large number of people that we have speaking, I will hold you to your five minutes. So please, I'm asking you in advance, don't make me be the bad guy and give you the gavel to gong you off your five minutes allotted time. Okay, is Mr. Murray Silverstone? Hello, I am Murray Silverstone, a resident of Tuscaloosa City. I'm a scientist, a science educator, and a parent of a six-year-old elementary school student and an 11-year-old middle school student in the Tuscaloosa City Schools. Both are too young to be vaccinated. Optimistically, I am expecting both will be fully vaccinated by the end of December. Unfortunately, as CDC timescales go, it will not be before. I would like to start by pointing out that nothing I plan on saying here tonight is considered controversial in the public health community, the scientific community, nor should it be controversial in our community. Many of us have two of the most precious gifts that we could possibly have received, our good health and our children. Those of us who have both, we are terrified that either of these most precious gifts could be taken from us. During the current pandemic, we are facing those very threats. We've been facing those threats for quite some time now, especially with the Delta variant. We have another precious gift. We have access to the advice, guidance, and knowledge of some of the brightest minds in public health today. The CDC, the Alabama Department of Public Health have been giving us their wise advice on how to slow the spread, slow the production of more deadly variants, and how to keep from getting sick with COVID-19. For some inexplicable reason, some of our community are refusing to listen, and others are even attempting to block this message with outright lies. But the message is clear. It can be summarized in three simple bullet points. One, get the vaccine. Two, social distance. And three, wear a mask. Many of our kids are too young to get the vaccine and will not have access to be fully vaccinated until the end of the year. Two, as most of us know, social distancing has not been enforced during lunch, leading to at least one rolling outbreak during which 11 out of 59, that is almost 20% of the sixth graders at Tuscaloosa Magnet School Middle were infected. Three, it is unrealistic to expect that anything short of a mask mandate will keep kids protected by having everyone masked. Changing from a mandate to masks highly recommended is a clear and false message that masks are not needed. The CDC and the ADPH both recommend mask mandates while indoors in public until the rate of transmission averaged over seven days is fewer than a 10 per 100,000. The numbers that will be offered today by Superintendent Daria are over 40 per 100,000, four times higher. Less than one week ago, when UA had a rate of 19 per 100,000, they extended their mask mandate another month to be reviewed by October 29th. At UA, the mask mandate has been working. You don't stop doing what has been working until the public health officials indicate it's safe to do so. They have already told us that when the number is lower than and has consistently remained lower than 10 per 100,000. As parents, we are entrusting both of our two pre most precious gifts into your care, our children and both their and our health. I know you say you keep their health and safety in mind. I know you are trying to make the right decisions to provide for their education as best they can be educated in person and in the classroom. The only way we can continue to do so while the infection rate is above 10 per 100,000 is to keep a mask mandate until everyone in the system can be vaccinated. We are tired of masking. I get it, we're not wearing masks because it's convenient. We don't wear masks because it feels good. We wear masks because public health scientists have proven that that helps our community, that helps protect our families, that helps protect our children. That is why I say we need a mask mandate to continue through the end of the calendar year. After all, are we not our brother's keeper? Thank you. Thank you, sir.
And since we are in a Tuscaloosa City School building, I will ask that everybody please wear your mask. Okay, number two, is it Katie Carlson? Good evening, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I've heard some people saying recently, why we make our kids wear masks at school for eight hours all day long? when after school, on the weekends, in the evenings, they're going to dance, they're going to karate, they're going to sleepovers, they're going to their friend's house and not wearing masks. Why are you gonna make them wear masks in school? I think that's a legitimate question. I think that's a reasonable question to ask. The thing about those extracurricular, those social events, is that parents have the choice about whether or not they want to participate. They want their kids to participate in those activities, masked or unmasked. Those parents can make that choice. I don't have a choice about sending my kid to school. The law says I have to send my kid to school. If I don't, y'all gonna come after me, I'm sure, right? Is what I'm supposed to do. The other thing I don't have a choice about is whether or not my child can be vaccinated. If your child is 12 and older, you have that choice. So you can make that decision yourself as a parent. I don't have that choice. My, it's not available to my child. So I have to send my kid to school and I do not have the choice for her to be vaccinated. Vaccines are coming, as we've said, you know, as the previous speaker said, it is coming. And I'm so grateful and I'm so hopeful. And it is going to come soon. And that will, for me and my decisions and my choices, it will change a lot in terms of my decisions for what I do for my kids. But until then, my pediatrician, most of the pediatricians in this town, in this state, in this country, and every single public health authority has said keep masks on. In fact, ADPH just doubled down on that just this past week. Nobody's saying take masks off in two weeks from now. Nobody's saying that. Dr. Daria was very wise, I thought, at the beginning of this year to say, you know what, we're gonna follow the ADPH. Let's wait, see what they say. They came out, they said mask. We said, okay, we're gonna do mask. That was very wise. Let's keep that wisdom, please. I've also heard people say, I don't co-parent with the government. That's true. I do not co-parent with the government. I do not co-parent with the school system. But what we do have to do together, the school system and me as a parent, is we have to co-protect. The school system has to protect our children. When I send my precious, my precious thing in the whole world into school, I have to trust that the school's gonna do their very best to protect her. And this is the easiest thing, these, these masks, it's the easiest thing we can do to protect her. It's easy. It's popular. The vast majority of people who are going to speak tonight, who have been to all of these board meetings, who have been talking, want masks to continue. And I guarantee you that there are so many people out there who may not feel empowered to stand up here and speak because it's scary, it's intimidating. <coughs> they also want masks. They may not be here. They may not be emailing you. There may be parents in our districts who don't even have an email address or feel that they have the right to speak out, but they are scared of COVID and they want masks to continue. It's easy. It's the popular thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Miss Amanda Ingram. Miss Amanda Ingram. Mm -hmm. 
Good evening, my name is Dr. Amanda Ingram and I'm the parent of a first grade uh, student in the Tuscaloosa City Schools, as well as a toddler who will one day be a student in the Tuscaloosa City Schools. I really appreciate um, uh, the fact that there is the proposed two week extension on the table right now for masks to continue to be required in our schools. I'm here today to support that and um, for us to really continue to look at the numbers. Um, according to the Alabama Department of Public Health maps, we are still in the red as Tuscaloosa. Our transmission and positivity rates are still making us that color of red, which we love when it's crimson, but we don't love when it's on the Alabama Department of Public Health map. So the Alabama Department of Public Health has continued to plead with the schools to continue universal masking and preventative measures. A week ago, they cautioned that now is not the time to let our guard down. The local and national public health guidance is crystal clear. There is no room for interpreting it in any other way than schools should continue to require universal masking. In a class I teach, we use a process called deliberative dialogue to think through difficult and controversial topics. I know that this forum is not an opportunity for dialogue, it's more of a soliloquy, um, but I am still going to think through some of those deliberative questions that I would pose in my class. So one of those questions is, what if I'm wrong? Right? That's a good question for us to ask ourselves sometimes. So I'm here saying that universal masking in schools should continue, but it's important to consider I might be wrong. And the second question is, if I'm wrong, what are the stakes? What's at stake here? Right? So we require that children wear masks in school for a little longer. So what does that mean? Well, it's inconvenient for parents. I get it. It's another thing to fight with your kid about. It's another thing to make sure it's washed, that you make sure it's ready in their backpack, on their face, and they're getting out of the car at carpool drop-off line when someone behind you is cussing because you're not moving fast enough. Um, I know that um, I miss smiling faces. I don't know about y'all. I miss smiles. I miss seeing smiles. I have a pretty good smile. My parents paid for some orthodontic work for me. Like, I've got some good teeth going on, right? I like to show them off. Um, and you know what? I joke about that, but it's, it's real. It's awkward for peers to interact with each other sometimes and not be able to see, ooh, how are they feeling about something? Or for a teacher to look at a kid and say, uh, I don't know how they're feeling about something because I can't see their face. So the masks really do impact the way we interact with other people, and I understand that. That is something that is at stake when we're talking about continuing masks. Let's be real. My kid's teacher has to remind him to pull his mask up over his nose because he's six years old. And she is a very busy woman who has a room full of wriggling and energetic first graders. And this is one more thing that we're placing on her plate right now, is asking that she be a mask monitor. So that's another thing that's at stake. But we also have to consider the other side of this debate. What if the argument that masks should no longer be required is wrong? What are the stakes of making that decision? Well, if we go mask optional in schools, more people could get sick. And as more people get sick, and if masks are not on, there's gonna be a longer quarantine period. There's gonna be a 10-day quarantine for kids who are exposed. So that's more time out of the school building for our children. We also know it could mean more staff being out sick and being quarantined, which means that we're gonna tax our already taxed substitute teacher situation in the Tuscaloosa City Schools. And of course, we know that it could mean more illnesses, more hospitalizations, and of course, the ultimate, there could be some deaths. And obviously, we don't want that. The tricky thing about the stakes of being wrong here is that we would be actively going against the public health guidance, and we might have to face some worst case scenarios in doing that. In considering these two scenarios, I think the stakes of being wrong and requiring masks seem much lower than the stakes of being wrong and not requiring them. So I know this isn't always a popular option. I know we want things to be normal for our kids, and I think we're so close with vaccines being available soon to children five and up. For right now, I think we need to continue. The, the board has done this and the superintendent has done this so far and I appreciate it. It may not always be the most popular choice, it may not always be the thing that everybody wants, but it is the decision that is the safest for everyone. Use the ADPH as your scapegoat, blame them. Blame the CDC, you're following their guidance, right? And that's your job as the board and as educators is to follow the guidance of the scientists and those health officials. So blame them, make, your, make them your scapegoat if you're struggling with the decision to vote yes on this. I would hope that we can continue this beyond two weeks. I would hope that this can come back up for discussion in two more weeks. And I um, appreciate all the time and energy that you all have put into um, helping our schools and making these tough decisions. Thank you for your time and consideration. Ms. Ms. Kristen Rupar.
Good evening. Thank you for allowing us to speak this evening. We truly appreciate all of your time and efforts, reading and responding to all of our emails and listening to our concerns. We know this is not what you signed up for, and the exhaustion and burnout is real for many of us. I would also like to thank my kids' teachers and principals who are going above and beyond to make me feel comfortable sending my kids to school each day. I keep saying that despite such hope this summer, we're not in a normal year. Delta changed the game. We're still in the midst of a deadly pandemic, and to pretend otherwise is literally costing lives. Masks work. Self-reported cases have dropped in TCS since the beginning of the school year, and this is great because masks work. I appreciate that TCS is constantly reviewing the available data, but I'm struggling to understand why the universal mask mandate ending so soon is even up for debate when COVID transmission rates in our community remain so high and masking is working. ADPH guidance clearly states that community transmission rates of COVID need to be low to consider removing masks, and it recently urged schools to continue universal masking at this point. While the case numbers in schools may be dropping on the self-reported tracker, as of yesterday evening, like we've heard, Tuscaloosa is still high transmission. We know that self-reported data is not necessarily reliable. This data that we're basing decisions on is dependent on whether parents choose to A, test their kids, and B, even report the results to TCS. When national and state medical experts say that masks in school are still needed, you listen to them. I trust my kids' education to TCS because TCS is filled with brilliant educators who specialize in education. As for my children's health, I trust my pediatrician who specializes in pediatric health. You follow what the major, majority of experts in our community deem to be the best practices to keep kids healthy and in school. This isn't the time to be discussing removal of masks and especially basing removal of masks on data that is self-reported. Please take a critical think about this before we proceed with what we're proposing to do. My other thing, and people have already touched on this, is vaccines. Vaccines for the 5 to 11 age group are so close now, and I am hanging on to this hope. We have sacrificed a lot in my family, and this is a big deal for us. Until my kids can be vaccinated, masks are the only thing that we have to keep them safe from this disease. TCS can't social distance, I get that. We're not always cohorting, and we don't exclude close close contacts. So until my kids can become fully vaccinated, and this means that the vaccine has been rolled out, and they've had their two weeks post-second dose to build up their immunity, it does take time, I recognize that, masks are the only mitigation tool that my kids have. TCS does an excellent job and recognizes the importance of a safe learning environment in order for kids to achieve their best. So provide this. Provide this by continuing the universal mask mandate and other mitigation strategies until every single child in the TCS system has the opportunity to be vaccinated if they so wish. I know that you are faced with hard decisions right now, but please do the right thing for our kids. No one should be allowed to infect children with a communicable disease simply because they find masks to be uncomfortable. I mean, I get it, they aren't comfortable, I understand. But we're just asking for a little bit longer until we can protect our kids. We teach our kids to be kind and to care for others. Masks save lives right now. Masks protect our kids and our teachers and our community. Our kids deserve better. Please keep the masks in place until all kids in your system are able to be fully protected by vaccines. I want to feel, continue to feel safe sending my kids to school. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Miss Mary Grace Lyon. Me here, so I'm keeping my jacket on. Um, I'm not going to try to convince y'all tonight based on research, and I think I've filled your inbox enough with all that, and you probably have gotten it on both sides, I would imagine. Um, the only data to me that seems relevant and that we can agree on is the local data and kind of what's happening in our community. Um, and I believe we really have a lot to celebrate. Um, I was looking through the COVID dashboard that y'all so generously provided for us. And I was looking at the weekly totals. I'm sure y'all probably looked at it, but I thought this was pretty exciting. First week of school, five positive cases, increased all the way up to 153. And in the last five weeks we've fallen, this week we have six 
new positive cases in the city schools. So I hope that's something that we can all be really thankful and glad about um, no matter what side we're on on this debate. Um, and also, I think it's pretty telling, you know, if, if the masks need to stay on because they're working, you know, I would kind of point to this side of the graph and say, well, you know, were they working here? Because this graph is really pretty consistent with what the county schools have seen, what the hospitals have seen, what our community at large has seen. Um, I also was looking through this with our school breakdown. Uh, we only have one school that has over five cases right now. Well, this was earlier today, so I don't know. Um, but this was as of today. Um, and that school only has 10 cases. And we have a lot of schools that have zeros. Um, I know for several weeks some of the schools have had zeros. And um, there's about 2,000 of our students, when I added it up, who are at a school who, that have zero cases right now. So when we're talking about a mask mandate, can we look at all those parents um, of children who are at a school with zero cases and say, you have to wear a mask seven hours a day to prevent you from getting COVID at your school that you right now have a 0% chance of contracting from a classmate or an employee. Um, about 9,000 of our students, so about 83%, attend a school with five or less cases. And we're talking hundreds and hundreds of kids at those schools. So again, I think we have a lot to celebrate. Um, we have no new employee positives this week that I saw, and we have, as I said, six new student positives out of over 11,000 students. So that's 0.054% of new cases. Um, and as we, you know, as I've come to these meetings and listened to the recommendations to extend the mandate and then potentially lift it, it gives us the feel and the idea that there, there will be a point at which we lift the mandate. And so I guess my question is, if not now, when? Um, the numbers have quite honestly not looked better than they do right now this year, other than the very first week of school, and I doubt we'd kind of caught up with, you know, the summer. Um, so, and then when we look at the county numbers, um, they're not really any different than ours. That's a pretty fair comparison of, you know, about twice as many students as we have who share our same restaurants and going to football games together. Um, I think that's another telling thing. You know, there were some unknowns at the beginning of the year. You add tens of thousands of people coming into our city for football games. What's that going to do? Well, thankfully, gratefully, um, it doesn't seem to have had much of an effect yet. And so that's another thing I think we can be really thankful for. Um, God has entrusted we, me with my children, and I do have their best interest at heart. And I appreciate that many parents believe that this this piece of fabric or mesh or whatever the kids are wearing to school protects their child. Um, and I'm really grateful for them that they have had and will continue to have the opportunity to mask their children, if that's how they feel. Um, I actually am one of those people that doesn't co-parent with the government. Um, and I've said that before, and I still believe that. I send my children to school um, to get an education. Um, I would like for them to stay in the city schools. I have one that has moved to private school, um, but not everyone has that option. So I would just like to ask that we um, look at the data locally here and make a decision that seems reasonable that those who'd like to keep their children masks can and those that would like not to, to be able to do that. Um, and I do value every parent's right to make those health care decisions for their children. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Laura Jernigan. Good evening. I'm Laura Jernigan, and I'm nervous. <laughs> I don't do this. I can sing on stage, but I don't speak in front of people. So forgive me if my voice shakes or cracks or cries, because <laughs> I probably will. Um, I am a parent of two wonderful girls that are one is in fourth grade and one is in kindergarten and I'm a full-time working mom and so I understand that all of you are busy and you have lots on your plate and so I appreciate the time that you take to 
to do this. I know it's not always a fun job, but I appreciate y'all for doing this. And you and Dr. Daria as well. Um, and I wish I had your blanket because I'm freezing. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Um, you know, I am very much in support of lifting the mandate. Um, you know, I, I, it's a, this is not a for or against people. This is not anything like that. This is just for the choice, for parents to have that option to be able to do what we were given a right to do is parent our own children and make decisions for them. Um, you know, I feel that a mandate is an undue burden on a very small minority of the population, which is made up of our children and teachers. And there are many teachers who have messaged me who don't feel like they can say that, that they don't feel like they have a voice because they'll get reprimanded or they will get fired. And so they reach out to us, parents, and say, hey, I, I don't like this either, and I wish that it could change, but I know I can't say anything. Um, you know, I don't feel that 5% of the population wearing a mask for a third of a day, five days a week, is what's stopping a virus that traveled continents in five months. So again, you know, we are just asking for the option if people want to mask their kids, do it. That's, we're not taking that away from you. We're just asking for our kids, for us to not have to do that. Um, my fourth grader has not had a normal school year since first grade. Um, she's not seen a teacher unmasked since second grade. My kindergartner has no clue what normal school looks like. And she's having to learn phonics and enunciation through a mask that's muffled. And I'm seeing it's not working well for her. Um, we have, I'm listening to her try to make her sounds and things at night and I'm realizing she's hearing it wrong. And so that worries me, you know, I don't want her education to start off stunted because of something that can be controlled. And so I know this is not a fun decision. I know that people are going to be mad no matter what. I know that's not anything that like helps y'all. I get that. But the only thing I'm asking is that you do take the recommendation to lift the mandate. And again, if people want to send their kids in math, we, we see it now everywhere. It's not gonna be an unusual thing to see it. Kids will accept it and you can, they can feel good about it and we can feel good about being able to do what's right in our eyes for our children. So thank you again. I appreciate you letting us speak tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Bethany Smith. Once again, please wear your mask if you're in the building. You know, we're going to have to ask you to leave if you consistently not wear your mask. Okay? I'm Good short. Evening. Good evening, Dr. Daria and members of the school board. Um, I just personally want to thank you all for taking the time for us to share our thoughts and concerns with you tonight. Um, my name is Bethany Smith, and I currently have um, a second and third grader within the Tuscaloosa City School System. I have kind of stayed on the sidelines, I feel like, as a parent, just watching the issues regarding COVID-19 unfold, and um, have not been very vocal in sharing my thoughts. However, I want to speak out tonight because I just really want to plead with y'all to support Dr. Darius, Dr. Darius' proposal to end the mandate um, before October 20th. Um, I'm not here to debate the effectiveness of masks and stopping the spread of COVID, um, as I feel the lack of statistical differences between the city who is wearing masks and the county schools who have kept it optional have already shown that. Um, I'm standing before you for one reason, and really one reason only, and that is to be an advocate for my children and the parents of those who feel that masks should not be mandated on our children, but rather that us parents should be given that choice. Um, my educational background is that of early childhood development and psychology and with a master's in social work. 
Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, so my concerns about masks are more specifically related to the effects that masks are having on my children's emotional and social development, and ultimately their emotional intelligence. Um, empathy begins to really develop in the early grades of elementary school, and cognitive components of empathy come into their own by six or seven when a child begins to be more capable of taking another person's perspective. My second grader is a very emotional processor, um, and she has shared with me that she will think that a friend at school um, is down or sad, but yet she's not seeing that through facial you know, expressions, but she's trying to pick up on these things through them being quiet or different things. But it's becoming a hindrance for her, in my opinion, to be a good friend, and that's something that Tuscaloosa City Schools pushes, kindness and anti-bullying and all these things that we're trying to do to really get to the heart of the emotional side of our children. And I feel like the masks are, are stunting that. Um, recognizing facial expressions is crucial for the success of social interactions. And um, we express emotions through our face as a way to communicate. It is so very important for kids to understand how to express their feelings and to read others through facial expressions. These are ages where children are learning to mimic the facial expressions of their friends or peers to show that they empathize. When a friend is smiling, they smile back. And when a friend looks sad, it allows them to be aware and mimic this back to insinuate an understanding that maybe they're having a hard day. Um, uh, sorry. Um, there's so much research to show that those with a high emotional IQ will be more successful in life due to their ability to relate well with others and to read others. As a mother, I am actually more worried about my children's emotional IQ than I am about their cognitive IQ, and I am burdened by the potential damage this has and will continue to have on this generation. Mental health is at an all-time high in our society, with anxiety disorders rampant among children of all ages. According to the CDC, approximately 4.4 million children ages 3 through 17 have diagnosed anxiety. The CDC also reports that 1.9 million children ages 3 through 17 have diagnosed depression. With the issues surrounding the youth of today, it is imperative that we do all we can to help these children learn how to be empathetic, how to encourage, and ultimately how to recognize when a peer may need a friend. In addition to our children needing to recognize emotions through facial expressions, so do the teachers and the administrators within the school. I recognize that you have all been tasked with making the best decisions with the information provided to you. And these decisions have been mostly based on the physical well-being of the students. And I'm here to plead for our children from a holistic approach. In order for children to succeed and reach their full potential, all aspects of their development must be given attention. This includes emotional intelligence, confidence, social ability, and compassion. Please do not minimize these children's need to be affirmed through our facial expressions and smiles. There's got to be an end goal or the damage could be irreversible. I thank you for your time, consideration, and, res and I respect the difficult roles you all face during this pandemic. I ask that you please consider the children tonight and the parents of those who have been patient and waited for our choice in mass to be given back, the, mass, the decision to wear masks to be given back to the parents. Thank I you, recognize Ms. that many have Thank stated. You, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Okay, next is Ms. Allison Grant. Thank you, and um, good evening. Um, my name is Allison Grant, and I am the mother of a first grader in Tuscaloosa. Um, city schools and um, first I just wanted to say um, thank you so much to the board the teachers the administrators and the parents who have worked so hard to keep our children safe and well educated in the middle of this ongoing global crisis you guys have done an excellent job I know that you have read countless articles talked to parents and educators and thought carefully about the important role you play in our children's safety and well-being and it's not an easy time to be on a school board but you put safety and science first, even while under pressure, and you've saved many lives. Um, we know the pro protocols that you've enacted are making a tremendous difference. Um, and I also wanna be real with you. Um, like a lot of parents, I am exhausted. 
Um, every month, as a new mask mandate debate nears, um, my days are filled with dread. Uh, my first grader was a preemie, um, and she was intubated for several days at the beginning of her life. The trauma hangs heavy on me, as I imagine the worst case scenario with COVID. And um, I never want to sit next to her in a hospital bed ever again. Um, I work full time. I'm trying to keep up. I'm trying to push through the fear, make sure things aren't falling through the cracks in my work life and my family life, Thank while you. also processing the emotional toll of COVID and advocating for universal masks at TCS and also at my three-year-old's preschool. And it's a lot of work. I'm going to actually hold just a minute. Mm -hmm. He's going to adjust the volume just a lot so everybody can hear you, okay? Okay. Just a second, okay? You ready to interrupt you? We, we stopped your time. I'm sorry? We stopped your time. Okay. So just hold with just a minute. <laughs> Can you say something? Hello. 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 I think the rain makes it a yeah. little more difficult to hear. Uh, could you all hear me before? I don't have to repeat it all, but um, maybe we could give a round of applause to the board for their hard work. <laughs> and I was just saying I'm really tired, and I know you all are really tired because litigating this constantly is so exhausting, and I'm thankful for all of your hard work. And the gist of what else I was going to say is just that we don't, I don't know what Dr. Daria is going to recommend this evening. Um, I hope it is an extension of the mask ma mandate throughout 2021 because we know that our children are not gonna be able to be vaccinated before Christmas. Even if the vaccine was made, had emergency youth authorization on Monday, and every child got shot on Monday, that puts us at Thanksgiving week in six weeks. We are not gonna have vaccinated children before Christmas. And we don't have to litigate this over and over again. And whatever Dr. Daria's recommendation is, you can stand here in front of us today, and you can commit to continuing with masking until the CDC and the public health department in Alabama make a change to their recommendation or until we have enough vaccinations available for children that every family that wants one can have one. And I respectfully request that you make that commitment tonight. And I also just wanna make a comment about the previous speakers um, and some of the information that they shared. We have extensive research and information about masking and speech development, right? Many, many, many organizations that specialize in speech development are recommending masking. People who are visually impaired do not have social or emotional delays, and they do not have speech delays. So we know, and there's a ton of research that shows, that children can still read facial expressions of their teachers when they're masked. So I think that these arguments don't really outweigh the risks of unmasking and spreading this disease and possibly putting our children in the hospital. Um, and I thank you all for your time this evening. Thank, thank you. you. Ms. Jennifer Caputo. Jennifer Caputo. I'm a lot taller than Allison. That'll change this. I mean, shorter, sorry. <clears throat> Good evening, Dr. Daria and members of the board. I have lived in Tuscaloosa for 13 years and I'm currently a parent of a TCS second grader. I would like to thank all of you for your ongoing service to Tuscaloosa City Schools. Throughout the pandemic, I have been closely following recommendations from the CDC and ADPH. I have also been following TCS decisions and policies that continue to keep students, faculty, and staff healthy, and to quote an August 2nd, 2021 letter from Dr. Daria, offer the best chance to keep students in school five days a week. Over the past year and a half, I have sent emails to many of you that included links to specific information from the CDC, ADPH, and other health experts, encouraging you to continue following the ADPH toolkit for a successful school year. This evening, I would like to take a slightly different approach and compare our ongoing battle against COVID-19 to college football. Most, if not all, Tuscaloosa residents are familiar with Coach Nick Saban's process. During his tenure at UA, the Crimson Tide won six national championships. It is safe to say we can trust his process. In a recent video interview, 
Coach Saban discussed the process and said, it is the definition of the things that you have to do to accomplish the goals that you have. If one of our goals is to keep students in school five days a week, then one of the things we have to do is continue the universal mask requirement. As the ADPH school guidance states, in the K through 12 classroom setting, where students are engaged in consistent and correct use of well-fitted masks and have three feet or more distance from an infected student, they are not considered close contacts and do not have to quarantine. Understandably, people are thrilled with the decline in case numbers in Tuscaloosa City Schools. The University of Alabama is also touting a decline in case numbers accompanied by a relatively high vaccination rate. But the UA System Health and Safety Task Force extended the mask requirement through October 29th upon further review as we approach that date. If TCS switches to masks highly recommended after reviewing case numbers on October 18th as stated in the agenda, how do you plan to keep students in school five days a week? My understanding of the ADPH quarantine guidelines for K through 12 is that when masks are not universally required, more students will be considered close contacts and therefore will be required to quarantine unless they are vaccinated. As many have mentioned this evening, children under age 12 are still not eligible to receive a COVID vaccine. And my hope is that we will at least wait until they have that option before switching to masks highly recommended. Back in the spring of 2021, we thought we were approaching the end of the battle with COVID-19. Vaccination rates were rising among those eligible to receive it, and there was a brief period of celebration as if we were leading by a solid margin at halftime. By midsummer, the Delta variant took over, caught an interception, and scored a touchdown. We lost control of the game in the third quarter as Delta kept scoring points and hospitals throughout the state of Alabama were reaching their breaking point. When Nick Saban elaborated on the process in the interview I referenced earlier, he said we must define exactly what we have to do to accomplish our goals. Quote, and then the next thing is how do I have to edit my behavior? TCS and UA edited their behavior when we were down in the third quarter. Both institutions reinstated universal mask requirements in August regardless of the vaccination status to help us get back in the game and regain our lead over COVID-19. All of us would like to believe we are back in the lead in the fourth quarter of this pandemic, but we cannot let our guard down and fail to protect those who are most vulnerable. Just as Coach Saban would not remove his starting offensive lineman and fail to protect his quarterback when the Crimson Tide is only leading by a touchdown, TCS should not remove the universal mask requirement when our internal case numbers look good, but common community spread is still high and children under 12 have no other means of protection. Masks and other mitigation measures outlined in the ADPH toolkit are our offensive linemen. I ask all of you to keep our best resources on the field and work as a team until we win the game. No one wants to repeat of the devastating end of the 2013 football season. We all want to make, make it to the national championship game in January 22 and win like we did last season. We just have to trust the process. Roll Tide. Ms. Susan White, Ms. Susan White. Good evening. Thank you for he hearing me this evening. This is my first time speaking at a school board meeting. I am a clinical child psychologist at the University of Alabama. And for the past 20 years or so, I've studied social emotional development um, and the uh, child mental health and psychopathology. Uh, two earlier speakers, I also want to add that there is no evidence that people who are blind have any deficit whatsoever in development of facial emotion recognition, theory of mind, or perspective taking. None. So th I, that's, there's no research to back that up. As a parent, I am very concerned about the idea of masks being optional at this stage because I have done a lot of observational study, as have most of us over the past several months, and what I see is kids distancing more when they see those around them not masked. That they're, they're worried, they're anxious. Now what I don't wanna see 
is a child who might be vaccinated, might be in high school or middle school, and those who aren't vaccinated too, but bringing it home and infecting a loved one. And the guilt, the grief that that child would live with for the rest of his life. And now as a parent of two sons who spend a lot of time with their elderly grandmother, this is a fear that they live with, if I brought this home. So we are living with Delta right now, and we are seeing so many breakthrough cases. So I'm not saying vaccination is no good. I firmly believe in vaccination, but it's not the end of the day at this point. My bigger point right now is speaking from my professional training in the mental health crisis that kids and teenagers are in right now. There is no relationship to masking, none. It is related to COVID and the spread of this disease and the deaths that so many families have gone through over the past couple of years. We are seeing in this county, in this city, a rise in mental health problems, self-harm, and suicide risk. This is not a function of masking. So, thank you. Mr. Mike Linsky. I'm sorry? What was the name? Mr. Mike Linsky. <laughs> You're up. Mike Linsky. I thought I was signing in. Sorry, so I'm not prepared for anything. Um, I thought I was signing in. <laughs> um, but I guess, just thinking about this, it, until Children five and up can get vaccines. Just keep the mask on. That's all. Just have more masks. Thank you. Russell, excuse me, Russell Gold. Good evening, board members, and thank you very much for the chance to speak with you. Um, Thank you so much for your service during these difficult times. I wanna address two main things tonight. First, I wanna ask that you continue mandatory masking and indeed that you do so for longer than the superintendent has proposed for the remainder of the semester. Second, I wanna ask that you base your decisions not on the self-reported data from parents, but rather on the CDC's data on community transmission. I begin, of course, with the proposition that many people have stated tonight, which is that ADPH and the CDC continue to urge universal masking. I teach at UA, so too do we continue to have universal masking. We're talking about a population of students that is not yet eligible for a vaccine. Many students in TCS, including my own daughter, who's a second grader. The proposal from the superintendent discusses making further decisions about masking based on the self-reported data from parents. I urge you not to take that approach. I urge you to make decisions about mask requirements based on data from the CDC about community transmission level in Tuscaloosa County. Now, I urge you not to base your decisions on self-reported cases in TCS for a few reasons. First of all, let me say that good data is really good. That's a great way to make decisions. But so too is bad data bad. And there's no reason to think we have reliable self-reported data from parents. And indeed, if you talk to parents in my, our daughter's classroom, you can find out about more COVID cases than appear on the tracker. We already see underreporting of that data. If you indeed make clear that you intend to link decision-making to that self-reported data, you'll simply encourage some populations to further under-report. So, we know, in my daughter's school at least, what Mask Recommended will look like. We saw it before classes began and Meet the Teacher Night. There was about 5 to 10% masking in the school. I heard Ms. Lyon's position earlier about individual choice and parents getting to make those decisions. And frankly, I don't begin to understand it. Because good data is good, and we know that masking works when it is universal. And the thing that best protects my daughter's health is when those around her are wearing masks. 
I, too, am glad to see the number of COVID cases declining, both in TCS, as, at least as it seems, based on our self-reported data, and nationally, and in our community. But let us not confuse that trend, that decline, with actual low numbers of spread in our community. We don't have actual low numbers of spread in our community. Of course, we wish we did. But the CDC still shows transmission levels in our community as high. So, Ms. Lyon raised the question of, if not now, when? And I offer you an answer, which is, as several people have said, the end of the semester. As a parent, as Ms. Grant said, it's incredibly stressful to go through this process every month of, is the board going to take away masks? And will my daughter be unsafe in school? I ask you to take that stress away from us and let, put in a masking requirement through the end of the semester, when my daughter and others will be full, able to be fully vaccinated. Let those of us who wish to get our children fully vaccinated, let us do so before exposing, us to, before exposing our kids to significant risk levels. We've taken away the virtual option. Kids have to be in person in school. We don't have social distancing. The mitigation measure left is masking because vaccines are not on the table. So I ask you for my daughter's sake, she's seven. She'll be eligible for vaccination soon by the end of the month. The end of the calendar year will get us there. So I ask that you please amend the superintendent's proposal and indeed pass a universal masking requirement through the end of calendar 2021. And I ask that you, of course, you can continue to revisit that decision. That sets a baseline. You can continue to revisit that decision. But I ask that you do so by consulting the CDC guidelines for community, CDC uh, data regarding community transmission rather than the self-reported data from TCS. Thank you so much for your time this evening, board members. Good evening. My name is Hyunjin No, and I'm a faculty at the UA School of Social Work. I'm also a parent of two children attending TCS schools, and they are extremely happy to be back in school in person after a whole year of virtual learning and have many high hopes for this academic year. However, there was a setback in earlier this fall due to a COVID outbreak in my daughter's school, and she ended up in a quarantine due to a close exposure, and then a 10-day isolation after her COVID test came back positive. I'm thankful she only experienced mild symptoms, but she missed almost two weeks of in-person instruction as soon as her middle school year started, which she waited for a whole year. And she still feels anxious now that she knows she can really get it. And she's seen her close friend getting very sick with it and still having lingering symptoms. However, since then, her school adopted, finally adopted social distancing during lunch hour. And with mask mandate in place, we are hoping her and her classmates' learning will not be disrupted again. Also, we are hoping the vaccine for 12 and under will be approved very soon. Just till then, please keep the mask mandate in school so that our children do not have to go into the quarantine or isolation again. My daughter says it was harder than the year-long virtual school because she was in her room by herself 24-7. And the children's anxiety about COVID is not just about getting sick. They're also worried that they may be bullied for keeping their masks on if the mask mandate is lifted and masks become optional. And I don't think anybody would call them overreacting because we've seen how people wearing masks in public places were harassed in many occasions. And keeping the mask mandate at least until children can get vaccinated and most of them can take off their masks safely with much less risk can be a huge help to reduce the risk for such tension among students in school. And as a family of Asian immigrants, the threat of Asian hate has been extremely unsettling and has caused much stress on us. 
And as a parent, I cannot help but worry if my children may experience such hate if they continue to wear masks when their peers stop doing so after the mandate expires. Please consider these concerns when you make a decision on the mask mandate tonight. I have no doubt in that. You all have our children's best interests in mind, and I will continue to have trust in your wise decision tonight. Thank you. Is it Tanya or Tania Alameda? Mm -hmm. Tanya. Mm -hmm. My apologies. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, board members, and Dr. Dahlia, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to address you all this evening. I am uh, an associate professor of social work um, uh, from the School of Social Work at the University of Alabama. I believe there are a number of social workers here this evening. Um, if you guys would like to stand up and be noticed. <laughs> We're very well represented. Um, so the reason that I am here this evening um, is because I wanted to represent the Hispanic community that I know does not have um, a very large voice in Tuscaloosa. Many of the families, um, many of the Hispanic families do not speak English, and so they really can't practice um, civic engagement. I have, um, this is just anecdotally, I have spoken to many families that are very concerned um, about um, their children contracting um, COVID in school. And um, they are worried that if the mandate is lifted, um, that it'll be um, an additional burden on them, not only for the health of their kids, but for their own health and um, seeking medical treatment. Um, um, so I, can't imagine that there are a lot of Hispanics that come to speak uh, in the board meeting, so I wanted to, to do that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up is that while it is true that COVID cases across the country um, have been going down, they have been going down in the adult population. A report that was just um, published from the American Academy of Pediatrics um, showed, and they collected uh, data, state level data from um, 49 states. Um, I don't know which were the ones that bowed out, but um, it shows that there, that from the onset of that since the onset of the pandemic, there were 16.7 children um, reporting um, having contracted COVID. As of uh, September 23rd of this year, that number has increased to 26.7%. Um, so what I ask um, the board members and Dr. Daria is to please consider um, not lifting the mandate until either children can be vaccinated or we start seeing a decline in the number of children um, contracting COVID. And um, I want to point out that um, there's no universal um, way in which to report cases. You can go and buy a kit at CVS 
and um, you don't have to let anybody know whether your child has COVID or not. Um, and there are um, many different tests that are available, um, but we don't have a consistent way of knowing for sure um, which or, or how many children have um, contra or contracted um, the COVID-19. So until that happens um, and until children can be vaccinated and the numbers go down, I'm going, um, then I ask that you all um, please re reconsider lifting the mandate. Thank you so much. Mr. Michael Pierce. Hey everybody, uh, so I stand before you again as someone who thought in-person learning during the pandemic would be impossible, but I'm happy that I was wrong again. Uh, my seven-year-old son has greatly enjoyed and benefited from the experiences with his classmates in person, but I would argue that universal masking has been the key to the Tuscaloosa City Schools success this year at limiting the spread of this incredibly danger dangerous and virulent Delta variant. As a, parent, as a parent who worried that it would be difficult for my seven-year-old to faithfully wear a mask, I can tell you he finds it to be a minor inconvenience. He hasn't complained once, and I think we all agree for a seven-year-old not to complain shows just how minor that, that, uh, that inconvenience really is. Masks are simple and effective, and you all know this. Uh, a word of caution as you prepare to make adjustments to the masking policy as cases are falling statewide, nationwide, etc. We had a similar drop in cases in 2020. We're currently averaging 1,540 new cases per day in Alabama right now. That's less than one third of the daily cases at the end of August, thank goodness. But that's still more than seven times the number that we saw in late June when we all thought this was gonna be over, mistakenly. Furthermore, in 2020, we also saw a spike in cases as the weather grew colder and people were spending more time indoors together. Against this backdrop, children under the age of 12 are still not vaccinated. And the Delta variant is still three to five times more transmissible and has caused more hospitalizations of children in the last three months than we saw during the entire pandemic leading up to July of 2021. We must continue to treat this seriously if we want to ensure in-person learning for the remainder of the fall without major interruptions. The CDC and the Alabama Department of Public Health both say masking indoors is the way to go. And I urge you to extend the mask mandate for as long as it lasts and enforce it until all school-aged children can be fully vaccinated. There are those who say that cases are dropping and COVID is not spreading, so we just need to end the mask mandate as soon as possible. Well, from a chicken and egg perspective, this is not rocket science. I respectfully submit that transmission is low among school-aged children and has been because you have continued to require the simplest, the cheapest, the most convenient and effective way to prevent community spread, universal masking indoors. Are we all going to quit wearing our seatbelts tonight because Tuscaloosa City has a lower rate of crash fatalities than Tuscaloosa County? Of course not because wearing seatbelts saves lives regardless of what is happening in the next jurisdiction. Masks helped us avoid the problems uh, and did major disruptions in our schools uh, caused by community spread. With the future of the pandemic still in doubt because there still could be another variant and there are others lurking out there that could easily become as virulent or more virulent than the Delta variant. Um, with the, but with the future of the pandemic in doubt, and when the lives of our unvaccinated children and the most vulnerable people in our community still at risk, the only logical option I submit to you is safety first. Don't abandon the success that you've had in the fall of 2020 because some people feel that masks are inconvenient. Let's finish the job by finishing the semester with the minor inconvenience and maximum protection of universal masking. Thank you for your leadership. Vaughn. 
Thank you for letting us be able to speak with you all today. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Julie Vaughn. I've been a pediatrician with Tuscaloosa Pediatrics um, for 25 years now, and both of my children attended and graduated from Tuscaloosa City Schools. They're reasonably functional adults now. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm here today to strongly encourage the Tuscaloosa City School Board to extend its mask ma mandate. I know we are all more than weary of continuing to wear masks, but COVID-19 and especially the Delta variant are, are unfortunately still with us. Thankfully, the number of cases, the percent positivity rate, as well as hospitalizations and death rates have all declined over the past several weeks. But Tuscaloosa County and nearly the entire state of Alabama remain in a high rate of community transmission, the infamous red on the maps that they show you. Um, the CDC still advises masking indoors in public if you are in an area of either substantial or high transmission, when we haven't even gotten down to substantial yet. Um, the CDC also still recommends quarantining for at least 10 days after coming in close contact with someone who is positive for COVID if you are not fully vaccinated. Um, I assume ex excused absences should continue to be allowed for quarantining. Um, I'd like to go over some um, quick numbers um, to sh show you about how things are better, but not there yet. Um, the highest number of daily cases we had in Alabama peaked in January of 2021 at about 5,000. Um, at the end of August in 2021, it was also back up to 5,000. As of earlier this week, we were down to 1,500 but the numbers that we had in May and June were down below 500. So we're much better, but we still have a long way to go. Hospitalizations in Alabama are similar. In January of 2021, um, per day, the uh, it, total um, per day in January of 2021 was about 3,000. At the end of August, it was almost 3,000. Um, as of earlier this week, it's about 1,250, but in May and June, it was averaging 200 to 300, so again, much better, but far from being there yet. We like good competition in Tuscaloosa. This is where I was gonna present these great numbers I found on the COVID dashboard and compare city with county schools, but the county schools da dashboard is really not great data. So I only have one point that I can, that, that I know of that about a month ago, the Tuscaloosa County Schools had the distinction of having the second highest positive number of cases in the state at that time County schools had over four times the number of cases that city schools did with less than double the amount of students um, that are um, county versus city. So I think that shows that with, I feel that with the, um, the city schools are doing much better with their numbers than the county schools are. And I think the only difference between the two schools is that y'all have continued a mass mandate and they have not. Um, I'd like to end by making a plea to keep our most vulnerable students safe. These include our med medically fragile students as well as the entire student population that's under 12 years of age. Even when the numbers of COVID cases were substantially down this summer, the CDC never dropped its indoor mask mandate for the unvaccinated. I strongly recommend that the Tuscaloosa County Board continue its mask mandate, at least until our elementary students are able to become fully vaccinated. Back 18 months ago when this all started, do you remember when we said, I don't wear this mask for me, I wear this mask for you. Remember that the masking works because everybody wears them, not just the kids that wear them. Thank you. Paul Rollins. Good evening, boy. Once again, I'm before you. And uh, it's starting to get heartbreaking. Why do we keep coming back, revisiting the same thing? Kicking the can down the road every two weeks, every four weeks. What can we do in two weeks about something that's been going on for two years. This pandemic has been going on for two years. You're not gonna see a change that dramatic in two weeks where you're gonna say, okay, now let's take the mask off. Have you considered 
what I consider to be a victory. We have parents talking, that's wonderful. But what about the teachers? Have we listened to the teachers? The ones that have to teach these babies. We know we can't social distance. So let's take the mess off of the kids. They can't be vaccinated. So I'm teaching these kids. I still have a family to go back home to. I thought I teach these kids every day. The last meeting you had a room full of doctors coming in saying leave the mask on. You have teachers that have to see the kids every day. You have the doctors that have to treat these patients every day. Hospital beds are full. And then my phone rings. Then I have to see the parents, the grandparents, and the teachers. So with these parents that I'm seeing, their kids are seeing them for the first time in maybe two weeks, a week or two weeks, because their parent has been in ICU. They haven't been able to visit their parent in ICU or their grandparent in ICU. That's the first time they see their parents or their grandparents or even their teacher when they land before them in a casket. Now that's heartbreaking. Wearing a mask for a few hours a day, that's nothing. You can take that mask off and put it on once you get on. But once you see your loved one lowered into the ground because of this pandemic, you can't get that back. The only thing you need to do is at least extend this to the end of the semester. Last time I was here, I asked, is there any way that we can possibly look at testing these kids? We can talk about numbers all day, how many positive tests we have in the school. But until we start testing these kids, we don't know how many positive tests you have in the school. You have teachers that are putting their lives on the line. The same teachers that at the beginning of this school semester, we were talking about their pay. If you're vaccinated and you become positive, you get your sick leave or what have you. If you decide not to get vaccinated, you have to use your own days. And if you don't have days, this, that, and the other. And they're still choosing to come to school and teach our kids. I'm not a teacher. I send my kids to school to learn from those teachers. So what do we, I mean, some of this seems like common sense to me. You have the University of Alabama School of Social Work. They're coming in saying, leave the mask on. It seems pretty simple. And we're taking up two hours of, of, a, of a meeting talking about <laughs> something that's simple. Again, when I see them, it's no coming back. It's no coming back. And this is something that's hurting these kids, the parents for the rest of their lives. Kids are bringing it home to their grandparents. They're going to see their grandparents for a weekend. Now grandma has COVID. That's the last time they see grandma until the service. That's wrong. That's heartbreaking. We know masks work, regardless of what anybody says. Before this vaccine was out, everyone said, let's flatten the curve. How do we flatten the curve? We social distance and we put on the mask. And it worked. The numbers went down. Now we're having to talk about leaving the mask on or taking it off. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. No one in this room has not been affected by COVID. No one. I don't, I don't, no one. It's affected everyone. With that being said, again, I ask that you at least extend it to the end of the semester. Thank you. It's Ashley Copeland. Thank you all for your time and letting us come voice our concern. Um, I just come tonight, um, mainly I think a gentleman represent, we come here with our two greatest blessings, um, our, fa our family and our health. Um, we also still come with our freedoms, like as of right now, our freedom in this country. Um, and that is, that's why I'm standing here, the freedom to choose. Um, that's what our country is about, right? choosing what we believe um, to be best for us and our family. Um, we've, been, we've been 
patient. We have been considerate of others. We absolutely, um, I absolutely encourage my children. We've had multiple discussions, as you can all imagine, about why we're wearing masks and why we're social distancing and why we're staying at home and why we're learning from home. Um, I was one of the parents that didn't work and schooled my kids um, from home when we were doing online virtual. Um, all of that is difficult. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to go backwards, right? I don't want to go backwards. Um, but I do want us to keep our freedom. I want us to keep our right to choose. Um, I believe that that's fundamental, fundamental in this country. Um, I come from a military family, so I know all about complying. Um, and I also know that sometimes when the date is, oh, just wait six more months, or just wait one more year, or just wait until the end of the semester, but what if it's not then? What if, what if this mile marker that everybody's hoping for still is not reached? Do we, we stay where we are? Um, I, I think parents should have the right to choose. My kids actually didn't test positive for COVID until the mask mandates. We were, I mean, they were in school with masks when they tested positive for COVID. Um, so I, I do believe that um, what we're seeing, some of the numbers, um, I think that a lot of that is the normal, the normal transmission for what happens, right, with the flu. Like eventually we're all gonna have it. Eventually we all will have antibodies. There will be vaccines, like everybody's saying, that we'll get every year, year after year. Um, and that's how like herd immunity, that's how our country or our community um, builds herd immunity. But I don't, I don't think that putting our kids in a state of um, removing what experts now believe like 70 to 90% of communication is nonverbal. So they're not just learning history and science and math. They are supposed to be learning how to thrive and succeed in this world. All of us, all of us sitting in here rely on, we have relied on nonverbal communication skills to get us through school, for job procurement, relationship health. And those are things that our kids are missing. They're missing it. So I stand here for you, I stand here before you just for, um, for choice. Um, and to continue to teach my children how to communicate other, other ways. And it's just been difficult with masks. They are confused by actions of their classmates. They're confused by tones of their teachers um, because they don't have the nonverbal cues to pair those with. Um, Nonverbal non communication improves a person's ability to relate, engage, and establish meaningful interactions. And that will be, that will be evident and present and necessary for them long after we have flattened the curve. Thank you. Okay, um, that ends our list of speakers and I do want to thank uh, on behalf of the entire board everyone that has shown up tonight to voice their opinion and voice their passion um, both sides of the fence are greatly appreciated so thank you to everyone that signed up to speak this evening okay moving along to item nine is informational reports from the superintendent nine <laughs> Excuse me, 9A1, receive, discuss the TCS stakeholder engagement plan update um, with Dr. Pope, Ms. Giles Brown, and Ms. Edwards. Good evening, board. Good evening. I do want to acknowledge um, Ms. Edwards is behind me, and she's our administrator of um, family and community engagement. and 
the director of federal programs, Ms. Um, Giles Brown. They are the um, the um, our lead on our engagement action plan. So basically, um, our stakeholder engagement action plan is one of the pillars that we talked about community engagement from the strategic plan, the draft 2.0, which involves how we're connecting with our community as a whole and our stakeholders. So this plan is um, an action plan that actually drives that those goals that we were discussing in the retreat in August. The plan is, is written for with timelines and action plans for 2021 through 2000, 2000, I'm sorry, 2024. The, um, our ultimate goal is student learning for what when our kids come into buildings with us. But we do a good job involving our parents, but we need to connect with the overall stakeholdering um, that could, the community, our churches, our um, the parents, but also the families. So this plan is actually targeting those um, priorities and making sure that we are connecting with the, the home and the um, school and making sure that everyone involved has tasks and also um, objectives at hand. So we're prioritizing the integration and implementing practices that are sustainable and not something that, that we're just starting and leaving. So we actually put those in writing as a plan of action that is aligned with our strategic plan where the PTA has national standards that has a framework of how it serves best to actually incorporate those actions and those practices. Therefore, we created um, an action plan that actually reflects the six standards that the PTA um, um, crafted. So this plan is actually reflecting. The first standard is welcoming all families. The second um, standard is communicating effectively. The third standard is supporting student success. The fourth standard is speaking up for every child. The fifth standard is sharing power. And the sixth standard is collaborating with the community. We believe that we stick and stand whole um, to those six standards, that we're working with the entire stakeholders, all of our stakeholders, and engaging them in the process of not um, the curriculum, but informing them of what's going on in our schools and making sure that we are all partners for our students to be successful. With that being said, we also partnered with Scholastic, which is a renowned um, uh, researcher, Dr. Karen Mapp, with dealing with families and communities. And in order for that work to be done, we have to make sure that we are, we're providing training and professional development for our team, which is established of our school leaders and our teachers to make sure that start is there within the schools and we're connecting with those um, other stakeholders. And with those leadership tasks and different um, workshops for the training, there are three areas that we're working on. We have to reframe our family engagement. We have to redesign the family engagement events because we do have um, family engagement events at our schools, but we have to re redesign those um, events to actually capture all of our family, all of our communities that are connected to our schools. And the third um, um, training is wrapped around engaging families in learning throughout the year. I'm not going to go further with the, the piece of all the other areas of the plan, but the engagement plan is uh, um, in your um, board um, agenda, and it actually follows our priority statement. If we value and leverage school and community partnerships, then we will maximize our collective impact on our core mission. And we believe that Tuscaloosa City Schools family engagement reflects equitable and inclusive relationships that honor the diversity of our community and share responsibility for student success. We welcome all families, caregivers, and the community as part of the culture of our schools. Thank you, board. You have any questions? Board, any questions for Dr. Post? Any comments? So, yes. Question on the printout that we got, the first one. Is this a draft plan, or is this what the is out for the public? That's actually one of the training sessions that we did with the um, with, the, with the group already. So the the public can get this, or this is just the, the public can get is out there for the public already. Um, Ms. House put it out is is. Um, available for the public on the web. Okay. Yes, ma'am. The other question is about the stakeholder engagement. So I was looking down. I'm not going to be long. 
I promise y'all, I read this twice. On like page 11, and you may know off the top of your head, it says evidence of survey feedback from ACIP. What is that? Our um, a continuous improvement plan. That is um, what we're trying to do. I think we uh, um, what we talked about in during the retreat. In everything that we're doing with our strategic plan and any other plan, we're con directly connecting with our continuous improvement plan, which highlights all the areas that are focus for um, improving instruction in the schools and every school. I'm sorry, in every school, but also connecting with any academics and social um, and culture goals. Okay, what's the A stand for? Or Alabama. Gotcha. Okay. The other question is, and I forgot what page. On one of these, it says, like, measure of success, the agenda. What? Explain the measure that. of success, we, um, we, in the same way with the strategic plan, we have to have an artifact to actually capture whether this was this goal was particularly uh, was was actually met. Okay. So if it was a task that was saying um, that we were going to have attendees coming to actually go through the meeting, we'll have the agenda would be an artifact to measure the success of that particular um, initiative. Okay. And it was one more. We had a date on one of these, and it said when it goes down to choose item, it said not started, but it actually was 9-23-21, so we've started it. Well, this is still draft form because we, we hadn't, okay. we hadn't, um, well, you all have not approved the um, strategic plan 2.0. Okay. So we were, we put those dates in there. Again, this is fluid. Once the draft um, is approved, uh, the uh, 2.0 strategic plan is approved, we have to alter our dates in that plan to actually say, so we is saying we supposed to start at that date, but okay. we did not start because we have not actually approved the, the strategic okay. plan. I even read the one about the rug as the branding. I had to, I had to struggle <laughs> with that mentally for a minute. It, I, it, I got it, the rug as in welcome. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We got, we had that training that actually how it, it supports um, the culture of the school, but that connectivity of when the rug is, a, a, we think it's a simple thing, but it actually carries much weight. I'm done. <laughs> There's no problem. You asked the way, Dr. Karen, do you have more questions? No, uh, uh, I'm done. Okay, any other questions or comments for Dr. Pope? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, um, item number 10 is introduction of motions, resolutions for first reading, of which there are none, which brings us to item 11, the consent agenda. Consent agenda items 11A and 11B. Board, do I have a motion to approve those two consent agenda items? So moved. Second. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Those will be approved. Item 12 is the regular agenda items for final adoption. 12A, approved superintendent's recommendation regarding changes in personnel. Dr. Cameron, good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, board. Before you have the superintendent's regarded uh, changes and recommendations, and you also have a supplemental list, I will go through the list with you. I'll start on page one. You have one retirement. Four resignations, one new support personnel, one new certified personnel, nine part-time extended day tutors, and one 21-22 athletic supplement for West Lawn Middle School. Carries you to the supplemental list. You have one retirement, one new certified personnel, five new support personnel, and two part-time extended day tutors. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cameron. Uh, first, board, are there any set-asides by number and list uh, for a separate vote and discussion? Two, three, and four. On the first one. Main list. Sorry. Main list. Okay, two, three, and four will be set-asides. Are there any other set-asides? Okay, board, accepting two, three, and four on the main list. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. second. We have a motion. We have a second. Was it Ms. Williams? Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. 
Any questions for Dr. Cameron or discussion by number only? Call for a vote. Yes, sir. One's going to January, but the other. At University Place, yes, sir. This is November. We're going to be okay? Yes, sir. On number one, Dr. Prescott has contracted um, with his um, personnel, and they are going to help in that classroom until we can find an available teacher, teacher candidate. Any other questions or discussion? Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Those will be approved. Board may have a motion to approve number two. So moved. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Questions? Discussion? You know it's me. <laughs> <laughs> what? It, what? I'm going to another position. Yes, ma'am. Same as three. Yes, sir. Uh, working with Dr. Prescott uh, to see what we can do. We'll post for the positions. Um, as, um, as I'm in my notes, special ed teachers, um, they're not a dime a dozen, so we're, we're looking for them right now. Um, we've got recruitment starting uh, in October that we'll look for teachers. Um, and if we can find the teachers, then we can hopefully we can hire them in December and this, they can start in January. We can start them earlier if possible. But that's um, mm -hmm. special education teachers um, are hard to find, but we're out there trying to look for them. And Dr. Prescott's working with the principals and with the case managers of how we can meet those students' needs. So do we know, and we probably don't, the what? What is it? Because this is like the, yeah, we, this is, now this is the third, fourth, maybe fourth one. I'm trying to track them. I'm going to have my sheet. I'm going to do better at this. You're good. But this is kind of, to me, like a lot. And it's just. It is. Um, you've got uh, two and three. I believe they both are going to the University of Alabama. Uh, there. So it's, it's something that. If they have an opportunity, then they, they strike for an opportunity. Um, they're that the high needs position. So when they see a position they're interested, then more than likely they're going to get it. But we need to do things to attract them. And that, so we'll, we're having discussions with how we can attract them to our system as well. Yes, I agree. We have to not only recruit them, but retain them as well. Yeah. So the rapid numbers we had in that area, um, are they considered, are we getting to a point, you know, I know we did something in a specialty category, or something, are they get, we getting to that point and we have to do something? You know, in years past, we had them, um, if you'll remember, we lumped them in with our math and science teachers. Um, where we had math, science, and special education, and we gave them a uh, signing bonus. So we're looking at ways we can attract in those, those types of areas as well. But uh, as we said, we want to bring them to us, but we also want to keep them as well. So we need to look at retention. But we are looking at, at different areas to explore and how, how to get them to us. Any other questions about number two? Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? That will be approved. Board may have a motion to approve number three. Moved. Questions? Discussion? And you say we, we put a substitute or somebody certified in well, the class? Um, we're working toward a substitute. Dr. Prescott's working with his principals <coughs> and what we can do um, is meet these needs with, with the case managers there at that school. So we may, we may have other special education teachers there. How can we help with those case managers? And he's also using his staff to help as well. And we've got some contracted employees that could help through his office.
If you have questions about number three, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? That will be approved. Board may have a motion to approve number four. So moved. Second. Questions, discussion on number four? Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? That will be approved. And Dr. Cameron, thank you for the email to the board. I think it was this afternoon setting out the vacancies and what yes, the sir. plan is. Um, You're welcome. Yes, sir. Certainly, we understand two, three, and four positions that are <coughs> hard jobs, so it takes a special person. Hopefully, we'll work hard to fill those positions. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, item 12B, discuss approved extending COVID leave through October 31st. 2021, Dr. Cameron. Yes, sir. This leave, if approved tonight, will run through October 6th through the 29th, the end of this month. And this leave is available for all employees, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated with COVID leave, and it is a one time only usage. Board may have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Do we have questions or comments for Dr. Cameron? <laughs> it's like you looked over it like you know. <laughs> I didn't have a tab on it, but yes, I do have a question. Yes, ma'am. So what happens, um, this one's, if I'm reading correctly, you help me, you have to test positive. What about those, if I am, I'm just using this as an example, if we're working in a lunchroom or the mechanic shop, somewhere that works closely. And if somebody tests positive and I need to be out for a day or two, how do I use my leave? You would use your own sick, uh, sick or personal leave at that time. Yes, ma'am, you're correct. And this is for when you test positive with COVID-19 from a health care provider. So what do we do about those that we need to encourage? Because if me and you are working together, or you and I, sorry, are working together mm -hmm. and we're in that lunch room and you test positive, I really need to go, you know, at least for 24 hours, 48 hours, you know. I'm just trying to think it through. And it's, sure. when I read this, that was the only thing that bothered me because I don't want people coming to work and you've been sitting right with someone and which we already spent, as they said, two hours discussing masking or not masking. Now it's the fact that I want staff to feel like if they need to take the leave, leave. Right. Go get a test, but you, we got to give the body time to see what's going to happen. And they have that time. Now, they will, we also tell them if, they're, if they believe they're a close contact, they need to monitor their symptoms. If they're asymptomatic, then they're okay to return to work. But if they're symptomatic, then we, we ask them, you know, you feel comfortable, go get a test. Uh, so we do encourage the testing if they're symptomatic. But this type of leave would not be available to them. It's only if they test positive. So if they, if they were asymptomatic and then the next day they become symptomatic, they get a test, they're positive, then they can start using this type of leave. Any further questions or comments? Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? That will be approved. 12C, discuss approve Griffin Farms off-campus event. Dr. Pope? Yes, board. Um, this particular field trip was not on the one um, presented to you this summer. Um, we added this one when the, um, the schools want to. Um, we looked at and vetted it, and justification forms were approved. And we're asking that you approve this um, field trip to the kindergarten class of Werner to attend Griffin Farms. Board may have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. We have a motion. We have a second from Ms. Powell. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? That will be approved. 12D, discuss approved second reading of 2021 to 2024 district strategic plan 2.0, a focus on excellence, Dr. Pope. 
Yes, board. Um, this is the um, the approval that was. I'm um, just reminding everyone. This on um, the strategic plan is for 2021 through 2024. It has four pillars: um, student success with equity and access, stakeholder engagement, um, safe and supportive learning environment, and organizational effectiveness and um, um, efficiency. There were no changes from the last read um, um, from the previous board meeting. You have any questions? Okay, the board may have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All right, questions for discussion about the strategic plan 2.0. Dr. Pope, my only uh, comment is, you know, excellent work by you and your staff and the whole team involved. I think it does a lot of things in encompassing this board's vision and this system's vision and um, hopes and beliefs. And, you know, this board will do everything that we can to help you guys implement it to its highest levels. And uh, certainly that is way of reach for the stars and we look forward to it becoming a life um, instead of just on paper. So, so great work. Thank you. I just want to say something. We, um, the focus on excellence could not have happened if it wasn't him. Um, I'm not going to say the word to us, but we focusing on excellence. He was in making sure we did that. So, Dr. Derry. And, and I think that's, I think the board will recognize that <coughs> and everything that y'all do. Um, very proud of the work on this plan. I think this board is um, excited to put their stamp of approval on this plan. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? That will be approved. Thank you, Dr. Pope. Thank you. Okay. Item 12E, discuss approved 2021 AASB Delegate Assembly Selection. Okay, board. Remember, we have a delegate that we send to Birmingham to represent our system. Um, there will be two two people and an alternate. Yes, sir. First of all, before we start nominating, do we have any board members that would like to volunteer to be a delegate? <laughs> well, okay. So I will start this off, and it happens every year because he is usually not here on this day. And that uh, stinks for him. But I would like to make the nomination of, of Mr. Patrick Hammond. We have a second. All in favor? <laughs> what, what did they say? If you snooze, you lose? Is that right? Okay. Okay, do we have a volunteer, <coughs> new people, <coughs> new people, for spot number two? I would like to nominate Ms. Mine to my right. We have, a, we have a nomination for Dr. Karen Thompson Jackson. Is there a second? I move that the nomination is closed. I want to say it now. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right, Dr. K, you got a great friend over there. That <coughs> I don't know how much of a friend she is tonight. Do we have any volunteers for an alternate? All right. Thank you, Miss Powell. Okay, so Miss um, House, if I may formally state that we will be represented by Mr. Patrick Hamner. Dr. Karen Thompson Jackson with Miss Leslie Powell as our alternate. Thank you, ma'am. Thank Once you. Everybody. That city and they'll be sending you all a little booklet with the uh, mm -hmm. uh you know, with gifts. Gift? Uh uh. Oh, no, a book. <laughs> <laughs> Are there gifts in there? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay, moving along to item 12F, discuss universal mask with the recommendation. Dr. Derry. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Board. Uh, just to kind of open this up, I, I do want to say just a general thank you to the Board and this community 
Um, this, this issue is, as you look at it across our, our state, our country, is causing a lot of debate and unfortunately a lot of um, divides in communities. And, and I'm appreciative to be in a community that, that can um, look at this from all perspectives and from all sources of information and have a, a, a dialogue on um, what we think is the best approach. And from the emails, the, the, the conversations, the meetings, and certainly these meetings, I think for the most part, it, it's been still a very civil discussion, a heated one, but a civil one, um, with individuals on all sides of this thing, um, expressing their perspective and their support for that perspective, and I appreciate that. Um, board members, when we began this school year, like you all, I believe, we were all ready for a, quote, normal school year. We did summer learning um, with masks optional. We were successful in summer learning. Um, you're going to get a report here soon about summer learning. I think the early indication is that we, we were successful not only in hosting summer, but um, having some positive academic um, outcomes. As we entered June, uh, July, rather, the thought was to enter school mask optional. That, that was my direction, was to open school with masks being optional or highly recommended. And as we've heard and as you know, things changed. And that changed, I believe, my thinking and I think our thinking. Um, and the, the response at the beginning of the school year to put masks back on as required was in response to what we were seeing, that, that change, that surge we were seeing in cases in our community. And when we opened school, that turned out to be true. You, you've seen our tracker. You've seen those averages of those first weeks. We saw a spike in cases. Yes, they're self-reported, but they were there. Um, we saw employees with cases. We saw students with cases. The intent at the beginning was to take this uh, one step at a time. And I recognize that that is inconvenient, frustrating, and all the other descriptors you may put in there. Um, but the idea of long-term planning in this is difficult when you're not really sure what, what's in front of you. So the idea was to take small steps and evaluate this periodically. And you guys have been doing that, and I thank you. Um, I would love to be able to provide a recommendation that says, here's the best recommendation, here's why, and, and, we, and we can, it ends on this date and we're done. This is not allowing us to do that. The recommendation I've got for you tonight is an extension of the current mask mandate. It's the same extension I've asked for in the past and that you've approved in the past where it does end and move to masks highly recommended after it. Um, the only difference this time is it's not as long. And it's not as long because yes, we do look at the cases in our schools. Um, thankfully, we're at a much better spot. Are we perfect on our, no but we're in a much better spot. The same way when we opened school, we were not in a good spot. And I think we took collective action to say, let's look at masks as a, as a mitigation um, factor, uh, strategy. So my recommendation tonight on two weeks is to, again, take another small step and look at this. Our two week average, I, I reported to you in the board report, um, we're, I believe we're at a 0.5. Uh, as our two-week average. If that continues, I do think it calls the question of saying, do we need to continue a universal mask mandate? Um, and that is why I, I asked for a shorter period of time as opposed to such a lengthy period of time. Um, we do look at everything, including the cases that are reported. We look at our, our community rates. Um, but we do today, I think the rate was, we're at 40 something students district-wide that are reported um, with COVID cases. So in my thinking, it, it did warrant, and it does warrant, a discussion on our policy on universal masking. Um, but I'm still recommending an extension. I, I, I'm not asking here today to bring it to an end, um, although um, I think we're very pleased to see the decrease in cases in our schools. I, I don't know that we can look at it and say, well, we're, we're, out of the, we're, out of the, we're clear. We're not. We have to look at this carefully. The same way I would say if we do move to a mask highly recommended as opposed to required, and we see a spike or we see a drastic change, I'd be coming back to you saying, I think we need to look at masks being required again. Um, we've said at the beginning of this thing, we've gotta be nimble, we've gotta look at what's in front of us and make the best decision for that time. So board members, I, I present to you tonight a recommendation 
to go two more weeks, which is October 20. We do have a board meeting on October 19. Um, I did not write this in the board report, but it's, it's been the commitment that I've given to each of these times is that we, we have a period where we can evaluate it prior to its ending time. So October 19th, we do have another board meeting. I know it's fatiguing. I believe, I'm fatigued by having to come back and discuss this. I know, I believe you are. Um, but it allows us to see where we are at that time and not make a drastic decision based on what is right now a short-term positive trend. But if that short-term positive trend goes for a longer period of time, uh, it's worth asking the policy question about looking at our, our mask mandate. So board members, I'll do exactly what I think we've done in the past is we keep communicating on this. We, we make the decisions at the right time and not um, looking so far ahead and we'll continue to do that. If on October 19th, if we see these numbers we see here, if we see that positive trend change, I'd, I'd probably come back to you with a different recommendation. Um, but I do think it calls at least the question about the necessity for the universal mask. So board members, I have a, I have a recommendation for a two-week two continuation with obviously a discussion on our October 19th board meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Dr. Daria. Is there anybody that would like to make a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion by Mr. Lucas. We have a second by Ms. Williams. Questions? Discussion? I made a motion on this. I personally wish it was long. You know, but I made a motion because if we don't make a motion, it's gonna be out it's gonna be optional starting tomorrow. There have been a lot of good comments from our community on both sides. Tons and tons of emails have come across this talking about extending it. And I have to come in the football scenario. You don't take the players off the field just because you're up by a touchdown. It's Charles. But that was a nice comment. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that when we come back on the 19th, we got to be vigilant in making sure that we're going to look at this the right way and making sure that we're keeping every child in our thoughts because. Even though our numbers are low, you know, my job every day is at the hospital. And I have cold blues all day long. I look at funeral home cars lining up back to back, picking up bodies. So I live every day. Every day. I took two days off this week because it takes away and tell. We have to be concerned about our children and our staff. Because if you lose one, because we made a bad decision, we gotta live with that. So I wanna make sure that we're gonna come back, we're gonna look at this thing and keep it on the front burner, that it is important. You know, I know the, the people that don't support masks, but I have to wear this every day. You know, I know it's got it down now, but I have to wear it every day at work. When I leave work, going to stores, I wear it. And I'm so sick and tired of it. That, and even worse, we have to wear ones that's even worse than this because we have to wear the real hand magnified. Then we go to the patient room, we got to dress out with all that stuff. You know, it is, it is, it is very um, stressful and cumbersome to us overall. And I'm speaking this personally as an individual, not as an eight board member. But we got to make sure we come back on this and we stay on top of it. Not just, you know, for, for our community and for our children. And I say to the community, it's not just wearing your mask in school. You got to wear them in the community. You got to make your children wash their hands. You got to cut back on the hugging that we used to do so lovely every time. I know I'm a hugger myself. I love to hug on people. But we have to be careful. And most of all, those of us that are of age, 
we got to get our vaccinations. I've had all three of them. And they offer a fourth one in a few months, I'll take the fourth one. <laughs> but we got to get our vaccinations. And we got to encourage people to take the vaccination. Because if people say the vaccination, you might get sick. But if you don't get it, you might be seeing Mr. Roberts. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Ms. Brandt, yes, ma'am. Um, I wrote down a couple of things. Um, <coughs> just, you know, that Adam said, he said, he's our
the tax people tell them what to do, mandate, um, the IRS, I'm scared of all those people, the police, and so on. <laughs> why are we fighting like that? And I'm just encouraging the public, anybody on YouTube, to please stop emailing us these negative emails. You could probably continue to, but just, it, it's not working. And it, it's really showing, um, I don't want to use certain words, you know, but how we can our children be um, respectful people if they see them do tear down community leaders and things, and really volunteers and elected officials being nasty about masses, taking us in a national pandemic that nobody has control over but God. And so, um, and these scientists that come down just trying to get it. So I just encourage everyone to stay safe. Um, hopefully after, you know, October 20th, it could be the fourth one. And we can pull the mask off, but, you know, I just encourage you to stay safe. And I thank you, Dr. Beer, because you're doing all you can. I know you are tired. I know everybody is super tired, you know, like, and it's, we, we've been here two hours talking about this. And so I just had to speak my piece because I've been going through a lot of those emails, whether I'm going to email them back and so if it's a boy email, I'm not saying too much because I'm there to him. But if you are dressing me like a book, I address that, thank you. But you you come and attacking me about the little money that they sent, put in my account, they cannot pay my car every month. I have a problem. And I just <laughs> had to say something today about that. Um, I think that's it. And I just agree, I read and do my research with the 10 year old that I have in Oakland from the COVID. Um, so she kept taking children, the teacher was sending her to take the children to the um, nursing station because the teacher, other teachers were out and she, it, it just a domino effect and just a bad situation that I think a lot of people are not thinking about um, when we got this one little thing they can possibly hit with and it's not 100% just like the vaccine is not 100%. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Graham. Ms. Jeff. Uh, honestly, if we're definitely going to support the superintendent, at least I am, in, in regards to extending the, the mass ordinance. Uh, my concern is, is that we're taking our foot off the gas too soon, so we should continue to ride it out. I would even suggest to the end of the semester, or even January 11th, I think that's the first board meeting of uh, 2021, that'll give us an opportunity to get football season on our bills, give us an opportunity to get back in the schools. Uh, that first week or so in January, and I'll be able to make a more informed decision at that time. So I understand what the recommendation is, and I appreciate that. Uh, but I definitely think we should extend through uh, our first board meeting in January 2021, 2022. <laughs> that to me, that to me is just good listening and good hearing. Uh, from the people uh, in our community, those around us and those amongst us who are as tired as this as we are. Um, our email box floods and flows each time the days and the, uh, I'm sorry, the weeks and the days get shorter coming up to a meeting, uh, which is, you know, highly ridiculous. Um, we do welcome the, su the support, we do welcome the emails, we do welcome, welcome concern for those that are egregious in my point, in my opinion, serves no purpose. Uh, those, and, and this simply is place an unfair target on our back once again in two weeks from now, and then possibly uh, another two weeks after that. So let's, do, let's give them one shot to uh, take their marks at us. I'm a big man, I, I'm really not concerned for me, but for everyone else around who has to make these decisions, my concerns are for them. Uh, my colleagues, my cohorts, etc., our staff members, uh, which is why I suggest an extended, extended period of time beyond the two weeks from now. Um, I think it serves a much better purpose than where we are at this point. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am with Mr. Simmons as well. I live and breathe this 24 7, so it's, a, it's the new norm for me working in the healthcare field, like Mr. Lucas. So I agree with um, Mr. Simmons. Let's extend it if you don't mind. Let's do it. Let's do the right thing. Safety first. That's always been my issue. Safety first. 
Um, well, I'd like to say, based on the communication that I've received, um, our, my District 3 remains pretty divided. Um, since, for the past several months, I've been saying that my priority is just keeping the kids in school. Um, and masking was the way to achieve that. Um, as of today, I think with the DCH inpatient number being 76, um, and I, you, can, you can debate whether that's high or low, but to me, um, and you know, a number of schools in our district don't have any COVID cases, and I would think that it is I'd have a hard time recommending that kids, all the kids that go to a school where there aren't any cases, that they would all have to wear masks. So um, I'm in favor of them being optional at this point. And as a parent, if you want to exercise your option to keep your child in a mask, I, I think you should do that. But I do feel that at this point, it's, it's safe for parents to have that choice. Yes. So, I have a um, couple of things that I was concerned about. The first one is the statement that was made that teachers are in fear of retaliation. I have a problem with that statement. I know people don't want to speak their mind, but when you come out and make a statement that there's a retaliation, that that means the principal that means the superintendent, whomever, if you make a statement, you're saying that something is gonna to happen to you. I believe that there are laws, and we'll just check with our attorney here. I may be wrong, because when you make statements like that, that's very demeaning to our culture. That's saying that we have retaliated. Now, since I've been here, I don't know of retaliation, but that's a hard statement to make. So if teachers are feeling that they're going to be retaliated against, I would suggest that in some form and fashion, please speak up. Because that is not the culture that we want represented. And that was a person making a statement, which that may not be true. But I just want to clear the air on that, because I don't like statements like that. That just makes us all look like we're not doing what we're supposed to do. I am concerned on the other end that we're back here again every two weeks and I do have a problem with that and I've said that. The first problem that I have, well this is the second problem, problem, I can't even keep up right now, I'm tired, is we have a recommendation to extend the COVID leave to the 29th, however we're looking at the 20th to end this statement. I just said I wanted consistency. If we're going to have one number here, let's keep the numbers the same. I don't like one minute, it's, we're gonna stop this on the 20th, but the COVID leave goes through the 29th. I just rather one number do it all. Now, personally, taking the step further, if the university can go to the end of the month, and I've said this before, I don't know we're not, why we're not going to the end of the month. I would prefer we go to the end of the semester when vaccines are available for the babies. Let's just get it all done. The children, everybody can be vaccinated, and then it's, it's a win-win at the end of the day. I do not want to see our system divided. One minute, everybody's trying to tell me we're one system. I do not believe in if Martin Luther King has, I don't care if it's three students, that is three students with COVID. It is not fair that Martin Luther King will be in mass, and then we go across the water, and there's another system not in a mass. I don't believe that. It is mass for all. It is what it is, period. I'm concerned about them all. We already have a perception problem. We're not going to talk about the elephant in the room right now. It is not the time or place. However, we got to be concerned about the children that are seeing the highest deaths. And that is our minorities. Now, we're talking about we got people that are working in the funeral home. We got people in the health care. I'm in a church setting where right now it's every two weeks somebody is dying with COVID. So one set may not be seeing this. The other set is seeing this. I don't know what the social and emotional effects are to the children. 
I know what it's doing to our community. And at some point, we got to all figure out this perception problem that we have. We've got a bad perception problem. And we just need to do something that is consistent where we understand all, all. You may not be burying your folks, but it's sure a lot of people on the Western end, they burying people every day. It's getting unreal and there's nothing we can do about it. However, we do know that there is a vaccine for the babies on the horizon. And if that can help, it can help. I don't know who's catching it from where, but I know we can't keep burying these people. It's not working. And if the only thing that we can do is control right now is keeping these masks on, keep them on. If our staff and our principals want this, and I don't know, but if this is what they want, then we've got to support them at the end of the day. We're already losing staff, and we don't even know why. They're going to other systems. They're going to jobs for different reasons. But if they are saying keep this on, if we're not supporting them, I don't know who we're going to support. Because I cannot go teach in a class. Y'all don't even want me in a class teaching. That's not a good scenario. We've got to support our educators. And those that are talking about retaliation, we need to fix that. I don't, that was just, that sickened me tonight to hear that. Because it makes us all look bad. I didn't like that. So people, be careful when you make broad statements. Have your facts behind them. Because if we start fact checking, it doesn't look good when you say things about it. How are we going to recruit people to come to our system? We sitting up here talking about we're retaliating. Come on now, we're talking about a mess. Keep the facts, keep it clean. But I can't, you know, I'm going to do what I got to do for right now. But we need to extend this to the end of the semester when babies can get vaccinated and people can just breathe. Because then my thought is, with every other seat, if we take these masks off, are we going to let everybody sit by each other? I mean, it's just so many things to go t with this.
him does not mean we don't care about the children. Um, I've tried to be really objective these past eight weeks, and, and twice I voted to extend the mask mandate based on the numbers, the local numbers, the DCH numbers. Say what you will about data, you can't ignore uh, what's happening in the county system, you can't ignore what we've got eight weeks of data from um, extracurricular activities, from football games, <coughs> high school football games, and these children being with each other more than just in the school. Um, it, it makes me sad that we're, that we feel like we're still being, I think, governed by fear. We were, we were fearful when we went from virtual to hybrid. There was a lot of anxiety going from virtual to hybrid at the beginning of last year. There was a lot of fear when we went from hybrid to four days a week last year. Um, there was fear uh, and anxiety about going to no masks in the summer. And, and each time, I think our fears were, were overridden. I think the numbers did take optional at this approach. At this time, and therefore my vote will be as such. And I'll call for any last comments by any more members. Okay, I'll call for a vote. All in favor of the superintendent's recommendation to extend to October 20th? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Thank you, board. Item 13, content of business and updates, of which there are none. General announcements. Uh, this house, the October 12th, uh, call of board meeting is to be canceled. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. So, nothing next week, board members. And our next call of board meeting is October 19th. So, I thank everyone for your participation tonight. And we'll see you next week. Oh, yeah. I'm done. 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 I'